Hello, everyone. Oh. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our 1.45 p.m. media availability. Um, here to introduce our speaker is Eric Davidson, uh, president-elect of AGU. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce someone who probably doesn't need much of an introduction, but I will anyway. Uh, Dr. Marsha McNutt is the uh, president of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and she has uh, just come from delivering um, the agency address uh, a few moments ago. Uh, Dr. McNutt. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm not sure how I should begin. Uh, would you like an overview of what I spoke about? Would that be best? All right, sounds good. Um, so. The main premise of my talk this afternoon was the fact that right now the geosciences are under siege. And we can look at that as something that has been going on for quite some time. It's not a recent phenomenon. Uh, we see budgets under siege. We see um, attacks on various aspects of uh, geoscience. And um, the question is uh, what to do about it. And the example I gave to the scientists uh, is the following. If I went to see my family doctor and he told me, gee, Marsha, you have cancer and liver disease and uh, you're overweight and told me to go home, I would probably not be very happy with that doctor. But in actual fact, when we go see a doctor, a doctor does not only diagnose what's wrong, but a doctor also tells us what we can do to get better. So a doctor gives us cures for what ails us. And my point in this is that what I think we've been missing in the geoscience community is not only diagnosing what are the problems with Earth as a system, things like climate change, environmental health, pollution, lack of sustainability, but we also have to be more forthcoming in finding solutions to those problems. So I suggested that we take a page out of the playbook of the biomedical community because after all, Congress and others are always very quick to want to fund the NIH budget, because not because NIH uh, identifies diseases, but because they find cures and they sell hope. And I pointed out that one of the most recent revolutions that has been going through the biomedical community is that of convergence. And convergence is the is a highly multi-dimensional systems way of looking at solving problems by bringing together uh, bioscientists, engineers, mathematicians, physical scientists, um, and uh, others who can uh, solve very complex problems. They uh, do this not just in a simple interdisciplinary way, but they do so by building institutes devoted to convergence science and by identifying devoted funding streams to fund convergence science and by educating students in ways of solving problems through convergent thinking. So um, 
there are a couple examples of times when we've done this in the geosciences. Um, the outstanding examples are in earthquake hazard reduction, where scientists, uh, pr principally geologists, worked with engineers, worked with architects, worked with city planners um, to develop uh, building codes that gradually made our uh, cities and towns uh, safer by uh, making sure that buildings could withstand uh, strong ground motions. But for the most part, we haven't adopted this kind of thinking, and we have very few institutions that are devoted to uh, interdisciplinary, um, multidisciplinary type um, uh, groups. So uh, I concluded by saying that uh, if we did this, um, the kinds of advantages we would see are geoscientists being viewed as contributing to resiliency, to better health, to economic competitiveness, and to uh, greater prosperity for Americans, and that we could be viewed more as part of the solution rather than as part of the problem. So I think I'll end there. Great. Um, if any reporters in the room have questions, please raise your hand and state your name and affiliation, please. Thank you. Uh, Peter Aldous with BuzzFeed News. Um, has, are you able to say, has the National Academies had any contact so far with the Trump transition team? And, and whether or not that is the case, can you talk a little bit about the Academy's priorities in engaging with the incoming administration? Uh, we have had uh, contact, um, as we have with um, all administrations uh, before. Uh, we've been asked to suggest names for uh, science posts for um, the uh, various uh, agencies, and um, we have supplied some suggestions. The, um, we do this, of course, on a very confidential basis. Uh, yeah, Alex Switzer with Nature. Um, can you just, I know you can't, talk in more detail, but like, um, can you talk a little bit about the time frame? Like, when was the Academy contacted by the transition team? And have you supplied to them all the names you intend to supply? Are you sort of done with that recommendation process and it's now all over to them? So um, it's, it, uh, I can't say for sure whether it's all over to them. I would be surprised because um, Generally, this works in um, three very distinct ways. One way is that um, they would first approach us for a long list of names. Um, none of the people have been contacted, so there's no indication if any of them are even willing or available to serve. So at that point, um, it's, it's really um, uncertain if um, even that list is a very viable list. Then there is a second um, point of contact at which they might come back to us and say, here are some people that we have talked to that actually seem willing to serve, what are your views on these people? So at that point then, we could say, well, um, from the scientific standpoint, um, you know, here are some things to consider about the various people you are looking at. And then a third way we get involved um, is that there are um, a very um, few posts. Uh, one in particular is the director of the USGS, in which the academy is, is uh, 
traditionally asked to actually recommend a prioritized slate of candidates who have agreed to uh, be considered for the position. Only the first has been done. But of course, it's very early in the process because um, cabinet posts are still being filled. And uh, the science posts are typically not um, considered before cabinet posts are filled. Of course, um, there, there have been exceptions. Um, as you recall, Jane Lubchenco was chosen as no administrator before the Secretary of Commerce was chosen uh, in the first term of Obama, but that was unusual. Go ahead. Uh, Michael Tennyson with uh, Simon Schuster, and um, I've just I really like your idea of the NIH uh, uh, model, and uh, we find a cure, and 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 the cure even uh, uh, creates uh, revenue. Can you see? Uh, uh, have you thought of any examples or any kind of applications that we could actually apply to uh, uh, geophysical sciences or s are the climate sciences or climate science? Uh, I'm looking at uh, uh, polar ice right now. I mean, it's, can we, how do you, how would you, how would you look at that? I mean, how, what would your suggestion be? Do you, you see any, any light on the horizon? So the examples I gave in my talk of uh, areas in geosciences that could benefit from convergent thinking other than from uh, the disaster area of making the nation more resilient or I, I showed one example of a paper already published where convergence had been used um, in estimating uh, damages using Twitter um, which was a method that um, could be used to help prioritize disaster response in areas where there were not other methods uh, that could help prioritize uh, where to send aid first, for example. Um, uh, I suggested environmental health would be a good example where one could uh, combine geoscientists, public health uh, professionals, um, toxic chemistry, uh, industrial design, um, uh, a number of other areas, because 10 million people die every year uh, from uh, problems in clean air, clean water, um, contaminated soil, uh, and um, there are a number of ways to address that problem um, either through getting at um, the contamination at the source or through limiting exposure or through improving the um, health response once people are exposed. And um, by having convergent thinking applied to the solution space, um, that's 10 million lives on the line that could potentially be saved. Um, another example I gave uh, is uh, sustainability. Um, and um, then I also talked about climate change, um, showing an example of um, uh, a design of homes in areas being threatened by coastal flooding. Um, with a home that's, that's designed for coastal flooding that's completely recyclable in the case of a hurricane. Dr. McNutt, th this is kind of a shop talk question, but from your knowledge, uh, how much did the academies, uh, what kind of a role did the academies play in advising the pres President Obama in the naming of people to the President's Science Advisory Committee, PSAC? Because I'm looking ahead now to wondering, will the academy have any kind of role or its members uh, in selecting the PSAC members for the new administration. So you get any you, kind of sense that somebody's going to ask you a question on so, that regard? So are you talking about PCAST? Uh, PCAST? Pardon me? PCAST. 
PCAST, you mean? Yeah, PCAST. PCAST, yeah, PCAST. Um, how much of a role did the Academy play in? Um, yeah. uh, okay, so um, I was not um, president of the Academy at the time that Obama staffed PCAST, and uh, appointments like that would have been confidential requests to the Academy president, so I really don't have insight into that. I'm, I, I'm sorry. And of course, my predecessor has now passed away, so I cannot ask him. Uh, yes, Dr. McNutt, Chris Russell, uh, freelance science writer. Uh, given the posture of the president-elect on climate change, uh, questioning the science and raising uh, the language and some of his current appointees about a hoax, how can you see the Academy playing a more robust role in going forth to the White House or trying to bring the science position in a public way uh, to the new president? Or, I mean, rather than waiting back, do you have a strategy or a feeling that there is going to be a more aggressive uh, push on the science front, particularly on climate change? So yes, so we um, have a number of um, we have a number of strategies we're going to be pursuing. Uh, one is um, a more robust communications plan. Um, right now, um, right, right now, it's important for the academy to be sure that, uh, as as you probably know, Chris, the messenger is as port as important as the message. And Mr. Trump has heard from scientists many times about the message of climate change. We think now he needs to hear from non-scientists about how important climate change is. And that is the strategy that we are trying to pursue. Because there are many stakeholders out there who are not scientists, for whom climate change is a real and present issue, and not just a future danger. And there are many people he is listening to right now for business, economic, and military advice who know the importance of climate change. And so it's, it's going to be much more difficult for him to say, I value, understand, and I'm going to take to heart everything you tell me about the economics, but then suddenly when you tell me that the climate change is nonsense, or it, that climate change is a real threat, I'm not going to believe that. You know, it's, it's harder for him to do that when um, they are reinforcing the message he already got from scientists. Are there any other questions from reporters in the room? Sure. Yeah, hi, just to follow up on that a bit more, um, what conversations has the Academy had or is the Academy planning to have with those uh, business, economic, other people who are actually speaking, the non-scientists who were speaking with Mr. Trump's team? So, so these are conversations we have all the time because these are people who are members of the Academy, members of the National Academy of Engineering, members of our government university industry roundtable. These are already people who are part of us and who have actually offered to take these messages forward. So, 
it's not as though we have to have some special convocation to do this. Hi, again. So I think one of the unusual things we've seen in recent days are reports that scientists are archiving climate data, mm -hmm. um, concern on non-government computer serv servers, concerned that it will no longer be available. Um, that, that seems unprecedented. I don't remember anything like that happening before. Is this an overreaction? Is it prudent behavior? I'm, I'm interested in, in your views on what's going on. So, um, let me say this. There are protections in place through uh, government um, data integrity and scientific integrity acts that would, if suddenly this data that was collected by government with government funds suddenly disappeared, there are protections in place that would say, hold it, um, that, that is not allowed. Um, this data has to come back online. Um, that said, uh, we look at the 18 minutes that disappeared from the Nixon tapes. Um, so, you know, it would be, I think, impossible for anyone to say that um, it, it would take, in my view, an incredibly coordinated move to delete all copies of what, you know, are obviously in this case fairly um, basic uh, climate data. Um, but on the other hand, um, I don't see any reason why if people want to uh, copy this data and back it up one more time, um, it's not something that if they want to do that, they shouldn't do it. All I'm saying is I think if the data suddenly were not available, um, there would be grounds to insist that it be brought back online. Are there any other questions from reporters in the room? <laughs> Sorry, just again. Um, just on the same theme, what message do you want to convey to scientists, especially climate scientists, who are, as we've seen at this meeting, many of them um, freaked out about what's happening? What message do you want to convey to your colleagues at this time about how they should be thinking going forward? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that that's a, you know, that's a good question. Um, I just, I, I see so many people in this country um, freaked out and concerned. Um, I would say that that is exactly what, I would say that is exactly what those who want to disrupt science are hoping to achieve. And the best we as scientists can do is continue to do the very best science we've ever done 
make sure that American science remains strong and don't let the psychological part of this be our own worst enemy. Because freaking out is not going to get us anywhere. I mean, I think if there are if and hopefully not when, but if there are real issues like, um, I mean, you know, if there are um, violations of the in-place scientific integrity policies, that would be actionable. Um, If there are cuts to the science budget in climate change at the federal level, we can work to get private funding to step in. And already we've heard from a lot of foundations that want to make sure that that happens. So, you know, I think that the worst thing we have to worry about right now is that psychological freaking out. OK, are there any other questions? Any other questions on the chat? OK, great. That concludes our media availability. Thank you very much. Thanks. And